I think, I, I wrote it initially as a kind of manifesto for, for thinking about what I see us trying to do in this project um, at this stage, and so it really is open to revision by hearing from you how you receive it and how you would like to alter it, um, how it needs to be altered. So we had discussions over five or six years in the Globalization and Autonomy group where we said, well, people said, well, isn't autonomy the same as agency? And we worked through the issue that no, um, certainly in, in, in Western cultures, autonomy is linked to agency. Uh, there is the assumption you do not have agency if you do not have autonomy. Uh, but there are many groups that we might categorize as human who are not seen as um, capable of exercising autonomy. And historically, those groups have been not just indigenous people, children, and the disabled, but also women. And um, I think it's very interesting, uh, because my university is prioritizing human rights as uh, a priority, um, Ruth Hall, in her recent history of uh, the rise of human rights, speaks about the ways in which autonomy uh, is tied to the rise of human rights. She argues it was impossible to think about human rights as a concept until the idea of autonomy developed. And in this case, she's stressing the notion of autonomy as, um, as bodily integrity. She talks about how families used to sleep together in the same bed, in the same room, and then gradually a different room was designated in the house. Gradually, people slept in their own beds. You know, this notion of um, the bodily is actually, embodiment is actually very central to autonomy. Uh, autonomy, of course, is also tied um, to the um, um, to the notion of uh, self-regulation. Uh, if you think of autonomy as the right to give laws to oneself, um, our team initially thought of that in terms of the nation state, in terms of democratic practice. Increasingly, though, they began to think about how that's tied to notions of the rise of the individual and to the, the individual who can regulate himself or herself, who can internalize all that societal policing and societal regulation. And of course, education plays an important, crucial role in regulation, regulating people's bodies, people's behaviors, disciplining the body. But that regulation is often described as freedom. As definitions de vírus foram atualizadas. As emancipation. Uh, how can I stop this? It's not going to just do, do, just to give us any message anymore. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. And so, I, um, in terms of some of the debates we've had here, in our team we had a group of people working um, with indigenous peoples. And in the reading that I've done, there's two, two different arguments made about autonomy and uh, indigenous governance. One is that autonomy is alien to indigenous thinking, to indigenous culture, sorry. Um, the other is that autonomy is at the heart of indigenous ontology and indigenous ways of understanding the world. Uh, the literature gives us both of these arguments, both of these positions. Um, and of course, it depends on how one defines autonomy. Uh, so it's not a singular concept, uh, but I think it is worth teasing through. I think it is worth thinking through how, how it operates. And uh, because autonomy has traditionally been denied to women and continues to be denied to women, Hall's book, I think, is very interesting because she talks about the ability to imagine uh, autonomy for different groups. And she, she suggests that women is the exact, the extreme limit. It's hardest for the majority to imagine autonomy for women. Um, and so to me, this, this makes autonomy a very, very important personal uh, question that needs to be worked through. Um, so there's a number, this paper is dense, 
And there's a number of places in the paper where I say things I'm not quite sure of. Um, there's also sentences that I could unpack into whole other articles, and I would like to unpack, uh, and, and sometimes where I have unpacked them in, into other articles. So I'm interested in seeing where you think there's a need for unpacking, where you think there's a, a problem or a, or a question, or where you know I need to bring in particular arguments by other people. You know, I've identified many places in the paper for my, myself that are like that. Um, Planetarity is, a, is a, 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 a very interesting concept because after Spivak introduced it, it's, really, it's been taken up and it's been dealt with in many different ways. And uh, I have been asked um, just during the break about planetarity. Uh, and of course Spivak uses it uh, as an alternative to globalization. And she understands globalization as the financialization of the globe, as a neoliberal um, homogenizing uh, view of the world and its peoples, um, something to be opposed, something that um, enables, uh, argues for a freer flow of, of, of goods and finance around the world well, setting up borders to prevent people from moving across the world and making it harder for ideas to, to move uh, across the world. It's, a, it's connected to a privileging of the English language and of um, the view of the world that goes along with that in dominant hegemonic forms of thinking. So planetarity, she argues, is best imagined from the pre-capitalist cultures of the world and when she says that, she's thinking of particular pre-capitalist cultures of the world. Um, initially, tribals in the north of India, in Bengal. Um, and then recently, she's been working in China with indigenous peoples as well. She's also become very excited about North American uh, indigenous cultures. Um, but I think it's still very problematic. What does she mean by best imagined from the pre-capitalist cultures of the world. I think she is looking for an outside. She's very Derridian, so she accepts that there is no outside, but at the same time, she's hoping that this may provide an outside uh, and a ground, a ground for alternative ways of thinking. And uh, for me in the paper, that, that search for a ground, even if it's unstable ground, as Jessica's uh, video show, even if it's a ground, that itself flows, that doesn't give you a steady place to stand. You know, where, how, where do we ground our thinking? Where do we ground our work? Um, but she, um, she says, as I say in the paper, <coughs> that she's given up to some extent on that concept because it's been taken in so many different ways. It's been taken for a kind of liberal environmentalism. It's been taken for a view of the world from outer space that is that same surveilling um, colonialist view. Uh, whereas what she wanted to stress was the fact that if you think of planetarity, you no longer think in terms of a liberal, human-centered view of the world. You no longer think that the human being is the center for perspective, for understanding the world. The universe is immense, and human beings are a tiny little speck within a very long, deep historical perspective. Uh, and within a very huge space. Um, so that's a little bit of, of grounding about where I've come from. The paper really does derive from discussions with people from many different parts of the world, many different ideological and cultural formations that have alerted me to how difficult it is to, cr to talk across our different understandings of category construction.